Hello, everyone, and welcome to another exciting episode of the YouTube show and podcast, None of Our Businesses, where we talk about the week's topics of news. It could be finance, it could be business, it could be other things in accounting or taxes, and sometimes it's none of those things, but it's always from the perspective of accountants. And with me today is Tammy Hess. Hi. And Charlie Zygmunt. Hi. I'm Ty Carr, and here's what we have on deck for you today. Mark Cuban, an online pharmacy. A CEO laid off 900 workers over Zoom, took a break, and now is back. It's popular to say that leadership matters, but does it? Accounting issues for crypto assets. El Salvador is buying up Bitcoin. And finally, the IRS implements automatic payment notices. And guess what? It's not smooth. All right. Well, let's kick this off. I'll shoot it over to Charlie. All right. So I've got an article we can talk about from Forbes that I thought was really cool. It's called uh, Billionaire Mark Cuban Opens Online Pharmacy to Provide Affordable Generic Drugs. And so what's going on is, like I said, you know, Mark Cuban is starting his own company, uh, another company called the Mark Cuban Cost Plus Drugs Company. Um, It's a registered pharmaceutical wholesaler. And what they do is they purchase the drugs directly from manufacturers and try to bypass everybody in the middle to lower the cost of more than 100 medications. Um, the article gives an example of one of them just to give you a feel for kind of what they're what what's at play here. There's a leukemia drug called Im- imatinib, which is priced at $47 a month on his site, but has normally has a retail price of almost $10,000. And so it, the way that they price it is, you know, as the name mentions, it's cost plus. So what they do is they put in a 15% margin on top of the actual manufacturer prices, uh, on top of actual manufacturer prices, and then they put in a three per, a three dollar pharmacist fee. And so you know, it's just kind of the background of this is that you know the markup on these generics is like average of 100% or more, and in some cases exceeds a thousand percent, according to the article. And uh, the other interesting thing I thought about it is that they're not going to actually take insurance. They're just going to focus on processing, um, you know, at that cost and just trying to get as much volume as they can. And so it's just a radically different thing to what we have seen in the past in both of these industries uh, of pharmaceuticals and also just how medical insurance plays into it. Um, And so the other thing I thought was interesting is it's not often that you see a pricing methodology be kind of the centerpiece of what's being sold, but that really is part of his kind of marketing ploy here is to sell this cost plus approach to pricing. And so um, I just want to get you guys' take on if you think this is going to catch on or if this is, um, you know, not something that you think will be successful. Yeah. I think it's pretty interesting. I think that it will catch on in, in terms of for the folks who are purchasing those types of drugs um, without insurance, because a lot of the times, if you think about it, if you get a kind of generic drug, often you, it's, you don't even have a copay for it. I mean, it's relatively cheap. Somehow the insurance has worked it out with those um, providers where it's like, it's not, there's a lot of cost there, but you know, I think those without insurance probably are, pay, are paying more of that premium fee for a generic brand, which doesn't necessarily make sense. So I think that that will help, but it is an interesting kind of approach. And Mark Cuban's always really kind of famous for going into new businesses and doing kind of new things and thinking of things creatively. But yeah, I'm not quite sure how how much lift that would actually be in terms of what the need is to that. Um, That'd be the interesting part, I would say, because I think it really is a targeted group of those who are paying for generic brands out of pocket that would actually utilize this um, new kind of um, service. I mean, it seems like a <clears throat> it seems like a great kind of thing to to get out there and for them that to have. I guess the thing that I guess yeah, I guess the generics is what is what makes this work. Because when you say cost plus, I guess what's in my head is well, how is cost being defined from what source? And you know, how, you know, the the problem is I think we all kind of intuitively know about the industry is that is that prices get inflated with marketers and various people kind of getting putting kind of their margins in there that can be in some cases pretty obscene um so how is it that mark cuban's group is going to you know they can at the pharmacy level they can not put the margins in there not put obscene margins in there but how do they prevent the manufacturer who they buy the drug from including an obscene margin um 
and maybe it is the whole generic thing is the key to that. I think that's part of it. I think um, his other answer to it is radical price transparency. So trying to get as much competition as he can in these prices and then being open with the public about what prices he's getting from the different sources and then basing his prices off those. The other thing that it mentions that I think is part of his uh, kind of proposed answer here is that um, they, they are planning to complete an $11 million pharmaceutical factory in Dallas. That's about 22,000 square feet by the end of the year. And so I think the long term on this, in the short term, it's like, let's do transparent price negotiations. In the long term, it's like, let's move into, instead of just being a cost plus retailer of these pharmaceuticals, let's become a producer. And that will help us to really control costs. Now, that's a whole different ploy. So who knows whether that will play out that same way. But, um, but you know, it'll be interesting to see how that goes yeah that's all that that makes sense that's awesome that that would work and you know as you were talking about that it kind of reminded me of the way like you know like costco and walmart work it's like why couldn't they have done this because they do this with other manufacturers where they really dig into the manufacturing costs of smaller brands who want to be on their shelves and like you know tell them well you you got to get your costs down because you know we're trying to keep low cost for our customer type of thing you know and and so you know i i I guess if if Mark Cuban is able to generate enough buying power to strong arm manufacturers in that way, he could do that too in terms of requiring a certain amount of transparency from the manufacturers. Um, that'd be, I mean, good luck to him on all of that. That'd be awesome. And then certainly if he creates a manufacturing alternative that is competitive to the uh, and and also drives costs down, it just seems like all of this would be nothing but good news for the consumer. Um, so yeah. I agree. I agree. And so, yeah, I just thought it was exciting and it'll be fun to see how it all plays out. Um, do you have another article we can talk about, Tammy? I do. I have an article from NBC News titled CEO who laid off 900 workers over Zoom returns following a break from duties. While the title is very descriptive, the article goes into detail uh, as to how back in November, or back in December, the CEO of Better.com held a three minute Zoom meeting notifying his employees that they were being laid off. The 900 employees that were joined uh, that joined the meeting were notified that they would soon be receiving an email from HR that would provide a more detailed information. The CEO shared with them that you know, with the changes in the mar marketplace, performance, and productivity, um, that those were the justifications for the layoffs. However, it was reported through the media that the CEO was accusing the employees of being unproductive, therefore stealing from customers as well as fellow coworkers. Shortly after the meeting ended, the employee's company-issued laptop went black. And as you can probably imagine, this did not go over well with the employees or with the board of directors, who requested that the CEO take a leave from his leadership responsibilities. Apparently, the board is now confident in the CEO and his commitment to provide better leadership, which they communicated in a memo to announce the return of the CEO. I watched the portion of the video um, that was available and was blown away by how much of the meeting was focused on the CEO's feelings of having to lay off employees. He even stated how he had done this once before and he cried and he was hoping that he would be stronger this time around. And I know it's not easy communicating layoffs to employees and you know, best practice would be to discuss layoffs individually and in person, which can be difficult with so many employees working remote. Taking that into consideration, however, I think that we can all agree that the CEO could have done things better. And while I was, you know, re really pleased by the board's uh, swift decision of having the CEO take a leave of absence, I am kind of struggling with the fact that it was relatively short. It was uh, like a little over a month. And the way that they returned, they communicated his return was just via the email saying that he's back and they, um, believe that he is going to be a better leader. It didn't necessarily say as to how or why or the what of that. Um, so I thought I would at least kind of get your guys' thoughts on the overall uh, story. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think it's, I think that as a CEO, you have some obligation to your employees, not only in the form of trying to provide them a job in some way, but also to um, kind of manage that whole employment relationship with Grace through all stages of it, including a, a termination. And so 
I think that he owed it to those people to give them something better than what they got. I think the, if the fact that layoffs happen, you know, that is what it is. Business is business. That's going to happen. It's just, you still have an operational choice in how you go about that discussion. And I think that the choice to bring him back and to issue a letter of, of how things are going to be great. I, that letter sounds like it would be a lot easier to send if the 900 people you've upset the most are no longer working for the company. And so um, yeah, I, I don't think it's ideal. And I, I think that the plan to bring him back, if, if there was this voiced outrage by the company, and then a short period of time, an inconsequential period of time passes, and then he's back, sounds to me like that was always the plan, uh, at least as, as I would look at that, especially if I were one of the ones who were um, laid off in that scenario. So yeah, that's, that's my take. What do you think, Ty? Yeah, I would just say bingo to what uh, Charlie just said, because, you know, if you're going to lay off 900 employees, you 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 got to bet that that board knew that was coming. You know, they weren't just surprised by it. They knew there was a plan to lay off the 900 employees. So, you know, at best, in terms of the board, you know, being shocked or dismayed about how how it went down, I would I would suppose that it, they might have been temporarily dissatisfied with the method or the means of communication or the lack of good communication uh, by the CEO for that particular event. But they weren't, they, it's unlikely they were shocked by the layoffs themselves or that course of action. And so then, um, you know, and probably they knew, you know, they probably had some sort of advanced knowledge of what the overall estimated cost of layoffs would be and what the layoff program included, including what severances or not severances and all that was was involved in coming up with that cost. I mean, that would be typical of something for a CEO to kind of share that with their board rather than just go it alone um, and then and, and see where it goes. Right. So. So, yeah, I mean, and 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 I thought the same thing, like what you said, Charlie, is that this could have been that this, this whole thing could have been set up to begin with for the CEO to take a leave of absence right after the layoff, you know, and then, and then to be brought back or whatever. I mean, at the end of the day, them bringing him back says it all. It just says, you know, we, you know, when you, when you talk about does leadership matter, this board doesn't think that leadership in that particular case, if, if we, they either don't think it was actually a leadership failure, or if they do think it was somewhat of a leadership failure, the message is it doesn't matter that much. It's not as much of an issue as, or it's not a big enough issue to cause them to permanently uh, seek another CEO. That that they feel that the the rest of the, di the the rest of the attributes this CEO has in running the company are more important than the leadership and communication skills that were involved in that layoff. I mean, that that seems to be the obvious message, no matter how how they want to window dress it. I agree with that. I think that if they really truly thought it was a leadership issue and and such, either it would have been a permanent display, you know, uh, leave of absence, or it would have been saying, here's what he, the steps that he has taken to, you know, prove or demonstrate that he is changed his leadership philosophy or will be a better leader or here are the things that the board will be monitoring going forward. But it was, I think you hit it right on the head there, Ty, that it probably was just to kind of save face because people got, people react. I mean, this went on the news, you know, everywhere, uh, you know, a month ago when it happened to be like, I was notified via Zoom with 900 other people that I was terminated or laid off. And so I think they had to do some quick recovery. Um, I think that their approach to do that is probably going to, is not going to land as well because they didn't really take it seriously and identify what the actual issue was. Um, and that was, you know, the method in which that he explain the the layoffs and how they did it with the folks so it'll be interesting to see where it goes I mean this was just announced uh more recently but yeah I can't even imagine what kind of uh cultural that has left for those who are still working at that company and are kind of seeing it being brought back yeah I wanted to talk about um an article that I saw in the journal of accountancy it was actually a it was actually kind of a, a summarization of a practice aid that if you're a member of the AICPA you can download um, on, so I'm going to, but I thought the, the summary that is publicly available in the Journal of Accountancy was, was um, pretty cool and helpful in terms of thinking about the issues involved in accounting for crypto assets. And I think, you know, the, the term crypto assets is, is intended to be broad enough to cover um, not only like cryptocurrency 
investments in cryptocurrencies, but also potentially now the NFT type stuff that you could be invested in. And so the the three the three things the three kind of areas of uh, accounting issues that uh, were identified uh, in this practice aid are the fact that a lot of times crypto assets involve uh, some kind of embedded derivative. Um, and I'll talk about that in just a second here. And then the other two were that um, it's common for people who are operating with crypto assets to engage in borrowing crypto assets or lending out those crypto assets. Um, so that creates other kind of accounting issues that may not be expected. And then the practice of crypto asset mining, uh, the mining activities, which uh, have historically been involved in uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, is all, creates other uh, accounting issues. Um, and and to, to start out kind of in talking about this, one important thing to identify is that uh, the Financial Accounting Standards Board, which actually sets accounting standards, has not set definite accounting standards regarding to crypto assets. So the practice aid that this was summarizing and the, the discussion from the Journal of Accountancy is what we'd call non-authoritative guidance. It's smart people from accounting firms and uh, kind of accounting think tank saying, you know, here's some way, here's some issues to consider, and here's some accounting models that you might apply to this. But that's not considered the absolute standard yet, because uh, the standard, the 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 absolute standards on these have yet to have been worked out. So it's an evolving area, both in business, of course, crypto assets are an evolving asset category in business but also it's an evolving area, therefore, in accounting and how you deal with it from an accounting standpoint. Um, and for those of us who watch and know that sometimes I also, I talk both about accounting issues and tax issues, this is not a tax discussion. Uh, certainly the uncertainties involved in accounting for crypto assets would also be involved in terms of knowing what the taxation is for crypto assets, but that's not the nature of this particular discussion. This, the article that I'm talking about here in this discussion is solely about the accounting model used that you would use in your financial statements of your business if it owned crypto assets. So, uh, you know, what's up with this idea that crypto assets may contain derivatives? Well, I thought an example that they provide in the article, which I thought provided one of the one of the best and easiest ways to think about this is that it's common in the in dealing with crypto assets that you might say that uh, you're going to get paid in Bitcoin and you're going to receive that Bitcoin or some other cryptocurrency, whatever it may be, uh, 30 days from now or at some specified period. The problem, and, and this would be the case if you're dealing in foreign currencies as well, is that the issue involved in that is that while you've specified the amount of the cryptocurrency that you will get for that service or for that product that you're selling, you actually don't know what the value of the cryptocurrency is 30 days from now. You know what it is today, but not 30 days from now. So what that means is that not only, you know, you may think that you sold it for some kind of, say, U.S. dollar equivalent, but because you've decided to accept Bitcoin and your financial statements are probably not denominated in cryptocurrency, right? So when you look at your balance sheet and your income statement, all that, you know, I can ima just imagine your financial statements are denominated most likely in U.S. dollars. So when you want to include a transaction that's been denominated in Bitcoin or some other cryptocurrency, what's the U.S. dollar equivalent of that? If if the transaction is not going to be settled for 30 days, right? You actually don't know what the U.S. dollar equivalent is, which means that you're probably including some kind of estimate of the U.S. dollar equivalent right now that has to be trued up later. And that's a classic case that that fact that you that the un, that the that the uh, currency itself or that the uh, value of the asset is changing over time and may change upon settlement. You're booking now for something that may change upon settlement. That is uh, by its nature what we would call a derivative, and and therefore that would trigger. You know that that's what the guidance was suggesting, or what again non-authoritative guidance. What some of these uh, experts were suggesting is you should be considering the accounting model that applies to derivatives for that kind of transaction. And you might not have considered that. You might have thought, well, I sold services. I provided, maybe my company provides consulting and I provided consulting and I'm going to get paid in a cryptocurrency 30 days from now. And I've estimated the dollar value of that cryptocurrency. I put it in my books, done. And you know, you didn't think about the fact that actually you now also have 
your receivable that's on the books is actually a derivative that is based on the underlying value changes in that cryptocurrency over time, and that perhaps you should be applying a derivative accounting model to that. So that's, that, that's an issue that's involved there. Um, and then on the borrowing and lending front, you know, if you're, if you're lending out um, crypto assets or you're borrowing crypto assets, the main point that they make is that the uh, accounting model for the asset side of the equation is not the same as the accounting model for the liability side of the equation. And I thought originally where they were going with this is the fact that let's say you let's say you borrowed a cryptocurrency, uh, some crypto asset, um, and then you also loaned one out at the same amount. The accounting models for those two things actually, you know, you would think that if it was the same amount, like let's say the U.S. dollar today value of that same crypto asset was a thousand dollars, and you borrowed what you think is a thousand U.S. dollars worth of a crypto asset, and you also loaned out what you think is a thousand dollars worth of a of a crypto asset, you might think then that those two things just offset each other on the balance sheet and they just stay on the balance sheet offsetting each other. But the reality of that situation is that it wouldn't necessarily because the accounting model for the receivable uh, is different than the accounting model for the payable. <laughs> you know, and, and you know, on the receivable side, for example, you might have to consider whether you have uh, some sort of uh, loss reserve you know, and, and what that might look like. On the payable side, um, you would not consider that you most likely would not consider the possibility that that the amount of the payable would go down, even though that could help you. Um, and so you actually could get some disparity there. But that's actually not entirely what they addressed in their example. They addressed a, a different disparity between the asset and liability uh, equation in the sense of what if you what if you borrowed a crypto asset? That would mean that at the time you have to book the asset on your books that you borrowed, literally, what do you have in your possession as a company that should be an asset on your balance sheet? And then you're also booking the obligation to pay that asset back as a liability. The accounting for those two things would also be different because when you book the asset on your books, most likely the, 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 the most probable accounting model to use is to consider it an intangible asset. And the accounting for an intangible asset going forward after you book it is not necessarily going to mirror the accounting for the obligation that you booked, right? So your obligation is going to be what you think you owe in the future, which also, by the way, has a derivative involved in it because what you actually have to pay in the future will de depend on the value of that uh, of that uh, crypto asset versus the U.S. dollar if you're settling in U.S. dollars in the future, right? So you've got that you've got that whole piece on the liability side. But on the asset side, you don't have that. You just have, here's what we think it cost us day one. And then after that, you might be testing for impairment of that intangible asset using kind of the intangible asset accounting regime. So you're going to get a disparity that maybe doesn't quite, isn't what you expected between the your assets and liabilities simply uh, when you record an asset, a crypto asset that you borrowed from somebody else or from some other business. So that, I, I thought that was an interesting point and, and something to consider. And then the, finally, uh, the practice of mining really revolves around revenue recognition. So if you are involved in mining, it could be that you're receiving essentially something equivalent to transaction fees because uh, people are paying you to uh, in to engage in the mining activity in some way. And so so maybe maybe there's transaction fees you're earning, or it could be that you are getting uh, like a block reward from a blockchain network uh, that has to do with the mining activity that you did. And to make that even more complicated is that you might be part of like some consortium where you are just one one of many parties that pooled resources together to do the mining. And so the block reward uh, the block reward is really kind of a pooled reward that has to be allocated in some way. So all of that brings in revenue recognition questions and how do you apply kind of the, the latest revenue recognition standards uh, to, to those issues. So that's just a flavor where I'm not, uh, I, I'm not giving a complete dissertation of what the answers are here, just, just throwing out what some of the questions might be with, with regard to accounting for crypto assets and some, some of the directions that uh, some of our uh, brilliant colleagues are uh, are going with um, how you might account for those things. Uh, what do you guys think about that?
Yeah, I thought it was a really interesting read and it's helpful, right? Because as you say, stated earlier, there isn't any guidance on that or official guidance or authoritative guidance on that as of yet. So hearing you know, some thoughts and kind of summaries from those, those potential questions to have is a great resource for folks. The only question I guess I have, and I don't know if you know the answer, Ty, but in terms of when is uh, authoritative kind of guidance expected to kind of, to kind of support the accounting transactions or do we even get a sense of that or can even speculate to that? I think uh, I think that that the issue had been submitted to the FASB and that they had said that they were they were going to address it and then they de delayed it and they so I don't think we know I mean we we know we know it's on their radar but we don't have a definitive calendaring of when are they going to address this and have some kind of uh, guidance out. Yeah, I think this is going to be, I, th I think they sort of have an obligation to get some guidance out. I think it's, you know, a lot of things are happening very quick in that arena and people are going to need to make decisions. And so it's going to be good if they can get that out sooner than later. But the only other thought I want to add is it's just interesting because obviously this discussion focuses around cryptocurrency, but if it were more common to trade in other derivatives uh, more regularly operationally, then this would come up more. And so I'm just thinking about it as if you were agreeing to settle payables for some fixed number of livestock or something like that, it would be the same accounting challenges. And the fact that it ends up being showing up as crypto is just kind of incidental to that's the most easy to transact third, uh, you know, form of currency. Um, and so I just saw that as kind of interesting, but it's, it's cool to see how those, um, you know, making it easier to transact is going to then pave the way for how the accounting will work for it, because that's what forces everyone into it and creates these think tanks to even discuss these issues. So, yeah, I think it'd be just interesting to see um, how that plays out. And I think it lets me kind of roll uh, into my next article really easily because I found an article in Forbes called um, El Salvador buys $15 million worth of Bitcoin really cheap as these sell-offs continue. So, you know, and just thinking about, about cryptocurrency, um, El Salvador wants to adopt Bitcoin as its legal tender. It wants to, it purchased 410 Bitcoins, like I said, for 15 million. Uh, this brings them up to roughly 66 million USD worth of Bitcoin as of last Thursday, could be as low as 10 to $15 today. No one knows it's Bitcoin, so we're all just going to kind of wait and see how that plays out. But um you know, they're talking about making businesses accept it as a tender. Uh, and so that's supposed to be a big, a big thing. Um, the, the uh, president of El Salvador, whose name is Nayib Bukele, calls himself the CEO of El Salvador. So he sees his role to the country as not just a leader, but as, you know, he views it like a business. So he thinks of himself as the CEO. And uh, it, it's, Another interesting point that the article brought up was that at the same time that they're trying to adopt cryptocurrency as their primary tender, they're also seeking a $1.3 billion loan from the International Monetary Fund, which has warned against using Bitcoin as a national currency. And so for me, um, it's just really interesting to see how, you know, I look at Bitcoin as this sort of anti-government kind of I, I answer to currency in a lot of ways. People who are getting into this are trying to get away from government intervention in currency. And so it seems counterintuitive to me to think about a nation adopting it as its currency. And I want you to get your guys' take on whether you think this is actually good for crypto or is this something that's, you know, counter uh, to the goals of crypto? What do you guys think? Yeah, I mean, it, it like every revolution, right? It starts with something that seems like it's counter to the system and then it becomes the system. So <laughs> that that seems like, yeah, it does, there is an irony there, right? Um, but um, I don't. I mean, I guess I don't have enough. I don't have enough of an economist in me to know like what does what happens to crypto when it becomes the standard currency of a small kind of uh, uh, rather. Um, I, I I can only I don't know for sure, but I imagine that maybe El Salvador is insolvent or at very least poor. <laughs> um, and so yeah, you know, does that what what kind of impact does that have on? on a currency that otherwise doesn't have like a home to then have a home in what is otherwise a, uh, a fairly kind of small and stable uh, jurisdiction anyway. Um, no, I, I think, yeah. 
That's a really good question. And the article talked about it a little bit just because it was interesting because even after they made this announcement that they were going to buy all of this up, um, basically the value of Bitcoin continued to plunge. Now it's hard to say, to attribute it to this news because, you know, so many things happened between that moment. So it could have been other factors, but, um, but, you know, it didn't look great for it. It wasn't enough to hoist it up out of being in a loss kind of position, uh, at least in that short period of time. Yeah. And, and, you know, as we're, as we're filming this, you know, the stock market has been taking a big hit and otherwise across the board, you know, what we know is that the Fed, for example, has um, talked about raising interest rates and that they have a program for doing that and also tightening up the money supply a little bit. And, you know, and what that generally speaks to is that the era of kind of free, easy money to uh, speculate on highly high risk investments is, is slowing down. Um, I don't know if it's completely over or not, but it's slowing down. And, and so I think um, I'm on the page of, of folks who say, you know, that, that has a lot to do with what's happening with valuations of cryptocurrencies right now is the fact that it's, it's, not, as, uh, it's not as much of a free-for-all to just uh, get easy cash to throw into these highly speculative type investments. And so um, they're kind of, yeah, they're, they're taking a hit on that front. And yeah, I think that may be the effect of El Salvador's moves may be impossible to isolate at this moment because of all this other stuff going on uh, worldwide from an e economic standpoint. Yeah, I don't have much to add on that on that because I think you guys both did a good job in kind of just, uh, just kind of describing that and also the questions because so I would have the same types of questions on that. It'll be interesting to see what happens with that. I don't foresee there to be many countries kind of following suit, um, and as you know, especially if the way that it's kind of going right now. But it, it will be interesting to see what that uh, that does happen. Ha what happens with that? And then also, I think it's going to be interesting to see if there, if that um, impacts their ability to get that loan and, and in terms of what they're applying for that said that they advise against the whole uh, cryptocurrency. So it's, it's it seems like it's bad timing on the on the country's part to go in to do this at this point in time. But maybe they know something I don't on that or that we that we don't that we aren't seeing. Absolutely. So yeah, like you said, it'll be interesting to see and, and we'll keep you posted as it as this situation kind of plays out. Um, do you have another article we can talk about, Tammy? Yeah, so a couple of weeks ago, I shared an article relating uh, or regarding the fact that the IRS had a significant backlog of unprocessed tax returns from previous years and the impacts that that would have for the 2022 tax filing season. This week, Accounting Today shared the most recent IRS news, stating that the IRS agrees to ease automated tax penalty notices. According to the article, while the IRS has been dealing with millions of unprocessed tax returns, its computers have been automatically sending out notice warnings to taxpayers of penalties for late returns. If you can imagine the amount of frustration and confusion a taxpayer may have in receiving these notices, knowing that they had already mailed in their returns, further compounded by the fact that they aren't able to get a hold of someone at the IRS, who I think the article said was only answering 9% of the calls, so pretty low odds there, um, it was pretty, pretty kind of alarming for folks. A coalition of tax and accounting professionals and organizations asked the IRS for relief for taxpayers from these automated notices and penalties during the pandemic. According to the article, the IRS pointed out the fact that they have limited funding, limited resources, and outdated computer systems causing delays and improvements and causing an IRS uh, you know, employee to have to work overtime trying to even get on top of these things. So I wasn't quite sure. It was interesting to see, like, here's all my woes of, like, why I can't do what we're doing. But um, but at the same time, the coalition says, no, that's great. But what we're asking for is a discontinuation of automated compliance actions, um, aligning requests for account holds uh, where with the time that it actually takes the IRS to process the penalty uh, request, um, and then offer a reasonable cost penalty waiver. And the last one was to target, you know, targeted relief from underpayment or late penalties. So I guess my question to the group is, is a coalition asking too much? Are they really trying to even the playing field with giving the similar response times for both the IRS as well as the taxpayers? What are your thoughts? 
Yeah, I think they should have similar response times. And I think the notices should be built with the planned response times in mind. And I just want to relate a story that I personally had that I thought was really relevant to this is because I worked for a place that had a lot of invoices and they needed people to collect on these invoices. And they didn't really have a good system for follow up. And so we helped them to get a system going where they could send automated reminders to people thinking that what would happen is we would then get this sea of payments for, for old invoices, right? Because if we're just really good at emailing and annoying people, they're going to pay. But the reality of what happened was that we got a lot of angry people calling in saying, hey, we don't, we thought we settled this stuff years ago. We, we, you know, and it ended up being very counterproductive to kind of the end goal. And so it's, I don't want to say that I kind of like see and sympathizing here with the IRS on their plight, but I could kind of, I've seen this play out and it can be frustrating. And it's like, sometimes you think that the task is just getting the, your voice heard, right? Getting the information out to the people. But it's like, realistically, it's a little bit more finesse than that uh, if you actually want to collect, because the truth is a lot of these notices don't aren't successful in generating a payment, you know, especially if people get them as false positives where they get a notice for something that's not real. Now they're going to disregard any future notice they get is, is kind of my take. But um, what do you think, Ty? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, when, gov yeah, government's sending out notices that are inaccurate, um, it, it does, it, it creates more time on the taxpayer side to deal with the notice. Um, I think exactly what you said, Charlie, it creates a sense of, well, if the notice isn't even accurate, then this isn't a real thing to worry about. And so then, you know, it, it creates a discounting of the seriousness, the potential seriousness of the issue. Um, you know, and historically, you know, I would say that the states have been worse about this than the IRS, in my opinion. You know, the IRS, in in my prior experience in tax practice, the IRS uh, occasionally would send out a bad notice, but they weren't as commonly inaccurate or mistimed as the state was, that the state you know, I, I just feel like, you know, the state would send out all kinds of stuff that just really never made any sense. Um, and, and so I've experienced it in that realm, but I'm not in tax practice now and things have changed in the last few years quite a bit with what the IRS is dealing with. So now if they're, if they're kind of doing the same thing, I, I, I can, I can relate to it on that front and empathize with how frustrating, how frustrating it would be. I mean, I do, when you listen to the list of things that, that the, uh, working group is asking for that Tammy was listing off though. It's like, we are kind of, they are shoving a lot of stuff in there. That's kind of like, you know, here's some real problems that we need to address. And by the way, it'd be nice if you did these other things too. And I think anytime, anytime you do that, you are kind of, yeah, it's just, that's a strategic, that's a political strategic question, right? Like, is it better to just ask for the moon and hope you get like part of it? Or is it better to focus your questions on what you really feel you deserve and should have uh, because it's it's of dire nature and you know and that's the and and you know the the problem there is that some of the things that were on the list that tammy kind of listed off like you know having more accuracy in the notices or having a better schedule of when the notices come out i would say is you know is is of primary concern more penalty relief for people who actually owe penalties is kind of like well it would be nice but you know if they owe it they you know or you know yeah so i guess i might I guess to say this differently and not ramble so much, I might rate some of these things as a different level of priority and to throw them all together kind of makes them seem like they're all the same level of priority in my mind. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's, that's great. I think that is true. And I, well, the other thing that was interesting is some of the, the, the notices and stuff, they were tied to actually laws and regulations as to when they are supposed to be sent out. So there's these weird things where it's not just an easy change of like turning the computer and saying, stop sending these notices. There are actually some changes that they would have to do in terms of the, the whether the laws that they're following and or, um, and you know, where they are in their own process. So it, it seems like it was the article was actually quite long, actually, when I was reading through it. Uh, and a lot of it was saying, here's all the reasons why, it's, you know, the IRS is having a hard time struggling with it. But what would be interesting to see is what can they do and, and how quickly can they improve some of these things where I think the notices alone would be the first one, because even if it is, you know, it, 
the fact that it's not right or, or it's even, I mean, doesn't apply because they haven't gotten to that, that filing of the tax returns. They haven't recorded it as of yet that um, having a, someone answer the phone to be able to say, oh yes, we totally understand that you're cleared. It's good to go. But I think it's the, the combination of the impact that you're getting a notice saying that you're going to face a penalty or uh, of other be late fees or whatever it could be. But also that when you call to try to resolve it, that you don't, you, have a hard time trying to reach it and resolve it. And then where are you left to go? And then three months later, you get another notice about that same year. And it's like, it's never going away. So it's, it's trying to figure out what can they do in the short term to kind of address those, those challenges. All right, everybody, that's going to do it for the None of Our Businesses YouTube show and podcast. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And please tune in again next week for more business updates from three accountants' perspectives. And please also check out our sister podcast, Profitless on Purpose, where they are discussing anything and everything relating to the nonprofit space. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye.